Uh, I work with the Irish Vape Vendors Association. We are the trade association for the independent vape industry in Ireland. Um, and I wanted to start, I don't think there's too many in the audience that won't know absolutely anything about vaping, but just to give you an overview and to kind of stand the ground of what this industry is or how this industry started. So it started with a patented product in 2003 by a Chinese pharmacist, Han Lick. Users took that product from 2004 onwards, took the product apart, the early iterations of the products that came from China, the Ruan company. Users took these products, improved them, went online and found other early adopters of the products, took them apart, solved problems with them, like how do you improve battery life of something that's tiny, and if the whole point of the, if the whole way that the product works is keeping a little piece of wick wet with liquid, how do we do that better and how do we do that more efficiently? So from these forums, these online forums where people, users were sharing this information, came entrepreneurs and problem solvers that developed products. People started using them first in Ireland around 2008, 2009. They were importing early models from China and elsewhere and making their own. And the first, <laughs> that should say 2012 there, but it doesn't. First vape shop opened in 2012 and Alex, put your hand up, where are you Alex? Alex opened the first vape shop in Talbot Street here in Dublin in 2012. Um, so the, 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 the industry, let's say in Ireland, started then with online vendors selling these products online and then kind of booked a trend of how retail was going at the time and moved into brick and mortar shops. And I suppose the success of the product, if you want to really boil it down into one sentence, the success of why smokers are able to switch to these products relies on the user themselves being able to choose from a vast menu and a vast array of products to build their own solution to how they switch from smoking to vaping. So they take their, their device and they, everybody has their own unique requirements for a device. They take a tank, they put it together, they put a liquid in it and they choose what they want from their liquid in terms of nicotine, in terms of flavour, even in terms of the ratio of the dilutants. So that's where it started. That was Honlick's early prototype. And those are the kind of products that we see on the market today. So to give you a very quick snapshot of who's using these products in Ireland, the Healthy Ireland survey was just came out today. I haven't had the chance to look at any more data other than what was tweeted by Healthy Ireland a couple of hours ago. But what we're seeing is that never users of these products aren't interested in them. So the, the percentage of never use, never, never smokers who are using these products is less than 1%. Now that hasn't changed between 2006 and this year. What I'd like to see is that exact figure to see even though it's less than 1%, is it going up or down? I don't, I, I don't think it is. What's interesting as well is that among ex-smokers, um, or sorry, among current smokers, the percentage has gone down 1%. So the last year, there was 8% of smokers using the products. This year, there's 7 What What does that data mean? Does that mean that people that were using the, the products concurrently with smoking, or dual users, as we call them, does that mean that they're swapping over directly to solely using an e-cigarette? It would be great to see more, more detail of that data. So the, the very, very simple question that a smoker has to answer for themselves when they're presented one of these pro with these product, products is, should I continue to smoke or to switch? And I think we should all agree in the room that making switching the easier choice is the right thing to do. And I think we all have... Uh, a responsibility, let's say, if, if not an interest, but we all have a responsibility to make sure that that choice is as easy as possible. So in order to do that, I propose that the products should be available, information about them should be available, they should be attractive and convenient to use, and both users and the suppliers of the product should be supported. So let's have a dig a little deeper into what maybe are the, the barriers to that. So, 
if a smoker is looking for information about e-cigarettes and they Google, let's say, the Department of Health website or an anti-smoking campaign website, what's the information that they find out about e-cigarettes you know, before they ever step into a vape shop? And let's have a look at that information because we in the independent industry can't advertise them the way we would like to to smokers. We can't inform smokers the way we would like to about the relative risks of what they might continue to do versus what will happen if they, if they choose one of our products. And then we have to wait six months before we can put the products on the market after they're notified. And we've never been really given a reason to, as to why that should be. Uh, other jurisdictions in the, EU, in the EU have reduced that wait time so that the products can get to market quicker. I don't know why we don't. And then if the, if the product is to be attractive and convenient, well, what are the barriers to, the, to that? Well, we put a label on the front of the product that looks as if it's a, a packet of tobacco cigarettes. And we do that even to products that don't contain nicotine at the time of sale. So we in the independent industry, if you walk into a vape shop, we're kind of basically lying to our customers because we're telling them that, the, that an empty tank that does not contain nicotine is an addictive substance and is an addictive product. Uh, we're putting restrictions on the bottle sizes through the regulation, so that has a number of different uh, consequences. Um, I have an elderly neighbour who vapes and I have to keep topping up his tank for him because he can't open a 10 mil bottle. Uh, we have the market kind of going towards these larger containers of zero nicotine um, where the user then buys a smaller amount of nicotine, pours them in, into one or the other. I don't think that's convenient either. And it's sending users who want to buy larger containers to, unfortunately, the in informal economy. So there's, there's an online group in Ireland at the moment which contains in and around 10% of the users of these products in this country, and they're buying untested liquids that are not subject to any quality control or, or testing. I, I, I don't think that was what anybody had in mind when they were thinking of this regulation, but that's the consequence. And then tank sizes. So we can't make a tank to hold the e-liquid uh, that's more than two millilitres. So that means that if you're a user, you have to keep topping it up. And because these uh, regulations apply to the industry and not to the user, the user is free just to go online and buy it from another country anyway. And then the nicotine content. So we're, we can't supply anything more than 20 milligram strength of nicotine. But we know from the evidence that uh, a smoker will need a higher nicotine level in order to switch. Some definitely will. Some will need to continue using that in order to stay off cigarettes at a higher nicotine level. And it has an adverse effect because we have evidence from Lynn Dawkins in London that people compensate with their puffing. So if they have a lower nicotine strength, they'll just puff more. And what do I mean by supported? Well, are vapors supported in the choice that they've made to improve their health, to improve their own health? So they've taken this decision upon themselves to use a safer product. They've done it without any government intervention. They've done it without any state cost. They're doing it of their own volition and they're doing it of their own, their own spending. But are they supported? What do their families know about vaping? What do bystanders walking down the street that are complaining about them vaping, what do they know about the product? Can they vape outside their workplace or do they have to walk down the road because their employer doesn't understand the risks of the product. And are we in the industry supported? Do we have enough tools available to us in order to switch more smokers, to offer the products that we know will work for smokers to switch them away from tobacco? And in terms of the, the kind of messaging that the people here and the public hear, and I, I'll apologise for being so hard on the HICWA report that came out earlier this year, but this is, this is the message that comes from the media um, 
about the product. So it starts in January, e-cigarettes are a good way to quit smoking, Irish Health, Ar Health Authority advises. So this was the HICWA Health Technology Assessment that was only looking at the product in terms of a smoking cessation intervention. It wasn't looking at the harm reduction potential of the product really. And then that, that changed April to smokers should not rely on e-cigarettes to quit, says Health Body. And then three days later, HICWA advised increased take, take up of renicline and NRT. Well, that's, it wasn't a very good way of communicating what that HICWA report contained, and it contained a, very, a lot of very good information. And the night that, or the day that it was, um, that it was published, this is what a vapor in his 50s, um, with a, he was part of a building crew. Um, I met him at, outside a hotel, we were both having a little vape, and this is what the message that he took away from all the media coverage of that day. Hikwa says we shouldn't be using these. And he had already successfully switched from smoking to vaping. So if that's what he's hearing, what, what, what are the rest of the smokers in the country hearing? And as we know, bad news spreads quicker than good news. So this is a very glib and quick illustration of two headlines that I found on an online uh, news, it's joe.ie if anybody wants to look at them. So you'll see good news gets 198 shares and the a very strange interpretation of data from a study that was published at a conference, 4.8 4 thousand views. Sarah will have a bit more information, I think, about the media portrayal in her talk. I didn't go too much into that because I, I could talk about it all day. So when we talk about the consensus in public spaces and vaping in public, um, the Minister for Health here decided not to include it in this workplace smoking ban in 2015, and that's been re, you know, restated by subsequent ministers. In the intervening years, we've had a plethora of evidence that says that there is no danger to bystanders. In our view, it should be up to private businesses. They make that, that business decision for themselves. There's balances, uh, there's risks and benefits of allowing vaping on premises and in workplaces. But let's have a look at the message that a smoker hears and that a vapor hears. So on the left, uh, you have a sign in a hotel which includes e-cigarettes, no smoking including e-cigarettes, and also warns a vapor that if they're caught vaping, they'll have to pay 100 euro for a deep clean. I'm not sure what that means, but... <laughs> And on the right is the poster from the HSE campus um, smoking ban, including e-cigarettes, no smoking, including e-cigarettes and all other electronic smoking devices. So these mixed messages confuse smokers and vapors. Um, if, and if smokers don't see the benefits or don't fully understand the benefits of switching, well, then why would they bother? And if I can give a very quick example, one of our members... Uh, when I was visiting their shop, had a, uh, a lady whose husband was in a residential care home and she was in buying a kit for her husband who was a smoker in the residential care home, but was becoming quite depressed because he had to be in there. And uh, she decided to buy him a vape kit so that he could at least, I think, have something to do. And he, she'd already bought a kit for her husband and it was taken away by a member of staff who didn't understand what the product was. So she was going back with this kit that she had just paid money for, for her husband to get her away from vaping and hoping that the right member of staff was on duty that day that would allow him to, to have the device. I don't, I don't think that's right. And what are all these things doing to public perceptions? Well, even though we have all this evidence... <laughs> this plethora of evidence that the products are safer than cigarettes, you would think, wouldn't you, that public perceptions would be going in the right direction, but they're not. Um, people want them banned because they don't understand the relative risks. And the figure from the Eurobarometer study that, you know, it, why anybody would have, would have an opinion to ban one of the very things that makes the product successful for a smoker and to ban flavours, 
I don't know, but these are things that we need to address. So what do we do next? The first thing that we can do, in my view, is we need the list of notified products published. So these are products that have been notified through the EU system that are that manufacturers and distributors are notifying as complying with the regulations and that can be legally sold in the country. Once we, ha once we would have that as vape shops, then we would be able to demonstrate to consumers, you know, these products are safe enough for you to use, they comply with the regulations, and you have backup. Um, what else can we do? Employers and managers of public spaces can't be expected to have the right policy for vapors if they don't know the evidence. So how is that evidence being shared? How is that, being, how is that evidence and, and information being disseminated? And can we start looking at the evidence that we have today and focus on the benefits of that evidence now, today, rather than focusing on something that's potential and small and future, which may not actually ever come to fruition. We would like more engagement with the regulators and government because we think we have a lot to offer. And that's something that's kind of lacking at the moment. We know that the current regulations aren't the right regulations to deliver the opportunities of these products for smokers. We would like that more proportionate. We would like sensible products on advertising so that smokers can find out about the products and so that we can tell the truth about our products to smokers. And we'd like to see more, more expertise brought into the arena of science and research. So I saw, I'm not sure if it was a letter or a report, but it was um, looking at the amount of people who were coming into maternity hospitals in Dublin who were using e-cigarettes. And the tone of the the tone of it was was so negative, but this is this was at the same time where some of these smoking challenge groups in the UK were looking at the evidence and saying, "Look, if somebody is pregnant and they cannot quit by any other means, and they find an e-cigarette is is helping them stay away from tobacco, that's fine." And you know, so how is that disconnect happening that we're not seeing that evidence here in the same way? And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.